The second method available to us for finding probabilities is the classical method. Now if you remember when we looked at the definition of empirical, it said that empirical means it's concerned with or verifiable by observation or experience rather than theory or pure logic. Mm. So guess what the classical method is? Theory and logic, yes indeed. So theory and pure logic. You're just imagining, hypothetically speaking, the situation. So if you imagine hypothetically speaking the situation, you imagine how many outcomes there are in the sample space and how many outcomes there are in your event, and you divide the event ones by the sample space, and you're done. Seems easy enough in theory, but it's actually more difficult in general to find than the empirical probability. Now that said, you've actually already found classical probabilities. When we did those roulette probabilities earlier, that was classical probability. You just looked at the roulette wheel, imagined that it was fair, and assumed um, every single slot was equally likely, and therefore you could find the probabilities. Same is true here, right? As a matter of fact, it's called classical probability because it's older. This is the probability that uh, those gentlemen, Cardano, Pascal, Fermat, this is what they were originally working with. They were working with classical probability because, in particular, they wanted to gamble and make money off of their less mathematically minded friends, and so therefore they wanted to figure out the theories behind how gambling works, and that's all based on classical probability. So gambling, classical probability and gambling go together in that you assume the games are fair and each of the elementary outcomes has the same probability, so you assume everything's equally likely. Now that's not always the case for classical probability, you can expand past that, but that's where we begin. So we begin, for example, when you have a deck of cards, you assume every single one of those cards is equally likely. Speaking of which, this is a deck of cards. So this is the 52 card deck that's a standard poker deck. So if you're used to playing card games at all, this is generally the deck that you are used to playing with unless you play with um, Euchre or Pinochle, which play with a modified deck. I have this deck for you in your exam notes packet, so it's right here in Appendix A. So you don't really have to memorize it, but you do have to understand it. Now I know some people do not play with cards. Um, that is not me. <laughs> My family is actually very big into playing cards. We've played cards ever since I was a little kid. So but you don't have to play with them. You just have to understand them because this is the foundation for one of the many different gaming systems that we work with. So here are the aces, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. These are jacks, these are the queens, and these are the kings. And there are four suits, spades, hearts, clubs, and diamonds. So if you're not comfortable with cards, if it's not something that is familiar with to you, one, you might want to learn to play solitaire. <laughs> that, that should be no problem for you, uh, just so you get used to the suits. And these are jacks. I'm, I'm just writing out the ones that everybody forgets. These are queens. These are kings. And the other one that's really important usually is aces over here. right? And the two through tens are pretty obvious, so that's no problem at all. You'll notice that two of the suits are red and two of the suits are black. So in case on your sheet, of course, they will all be in black, but when you look at it on the test, you want to be able to remember the hearts and the diamonds are red and the spades and the clubs are black. All right, so let's look. We want to find the probability, because that's what capital P stands for, probability of the nine of diamonds. Well, the nine of diamonds is right here. It's one card out of the 52 card deck. So that would be one divided by 52. This is a case where fractions would be way easier than a decimal. There's no point to coming up with a decimal for this. All right, now what about black cards? Well, these two suits are black. Now there's 13 cards in a suit. So it's 13 plus 13, which makes 26 cards. So there's 26 cards total out of 52 that are black. In other words, a half, right? A half of the cards are black. All right, what about an ace? There's four aces, so it's four out of 52. A face card, these are the face cards because they literally have faces on them. They have noses and mouths and things like that. So these are the face cards. So that would be, there's 12 of them because there's three per suit out of 52. 
All right, now what's the probability of a red spade? Spades are up here at the top, and in case you haven't seen it, they're black. So the chances of getting a red spade would be zero. There's no chance. There are no red spade cards. All right, if aces are low and kings are high, which is a pretty common way to arrange them for card games, then what's the probability of getting an ace or higher? Well, 100%, right? There's 52 cards out of 52 cards that are aces or higher, which would be 1 or 100%. Now, why are these probabilities classical? Well, because we didn't actually pull out a deck of cards and play with them, right? We just imagine it. We just assumed, or we just um, hypothesized this. Based on logic. Also, we assumed all the cards are equally likely. And we've also seen some other definitions kind of sneaking in there just a little bit. An impossible event is an event that has zero probability. It's an event that cannot happen. For example, the red spade. So the red spade has a zero probability. Now that's an impossible event. It's not an impossible probability. So you can say, hey, the probability of red spade is zero. That's no problem. Now what about a certain event? A certain event is an event that's definitely going to happen. It is certain which would mean it has a probability of 1 or 100%, namely the ace or higher. So this is the lowest we can go for a probability. This is the highest we can go for a probability. It's impossible to get over 100%. If you get over 100% for your probability, then you've done something wrong. <laughs> Same thing if you get lower than 0. For example, you cannot have negative probabilities. And we already saw this, but it bears repeating. An unusual event is an event that's less than 0 0.05 or 5%. That's typical. That's just a rule of thumb. It's not always that case, um, but it will be for us. That's the rule of thumb we're going to assume and use, that an unusual event is less than 5% probability. Now we're seeing as we do this that there's some rules coming out for probability. And I just said them. Namely, the probability of an event has to be between 0 and 1. You can never be negative and you can never be more than 1. That's what this is saying. Also, the sum of the probabilities must be equal to 1. Both of those things are impossible. All right, and a probability model is a list, usually in table form or graph form, of all the possible outcomes of a probability experiment and each outcome's probability. So we're going to determine whether the following are valid probability models. In other words, do they satisfy these two requirements? Is each of the probabilities between 0 and 1, and do the sum of all the probabilities make 1? All right, so let's look at this first one. Now, don't worry about the negative over here. That's not relevant. All you care about is the probabilities. Are the probabilities between 0 and 1? So looking down the list, all the probabilities are between 0 and 1, so that's good. But we need to know if they add up to 1. So you could either add them in your head, or we can grab a calculator really quickly. Bring it over here. All right, 0 0.35 plus 0 0.4 plus 0 0.1. Sure enough, it makes 1. So the sum is equal to 1 down here. So this is a valid probability model, this first one.
and it asks us to explain, we can say because each of the probabilities is between, I'll just write prob, each of the probabilities is between 0 and 1, and the sum of the probabilities is equal to 1. The two things that are required, those are the two rules for probability. All right, now I think we might be in trouble on the second one. Let's, let's look at those numbers. 0.25 plus 0.1 plus 0.3. Yep, we have trouble. <laughs> so let's see, the sum of these probabilities is 1.1, so this is not valid. Because the sum of the probabilities is 1.1, not 1, like it's supposed to be. And on the last one, I don't even have to check. <laughs> The sum of the probabilities is not relevant to me because this is a problem right here. It has a negative. You cannot have a negative probability. So this is not valid. Uh, negative probability is impossible. All probabilities must be between 0 and 1. And that is not happening here. And for the record, in case you were wondering, it would appear that these probabilities um, are empirical. They seem, well, they were made up, so they're not real, but, but they are empirical because they're based on data. This one's actually probably classical, but you could think of it as empirical for now because you were just given a table. But as far as you're concerned, these are empirical probabilities because you were given the data, you were given the information. And it's fine to think that for all of them, so we'll just say that. So note these probabilities are empirical. Now, grant you they weren't valid, <laughs> but nevertheless, just to help you understand that definition. They're based on given data.